Hey guys, happy Thursday. Today is, as you know, Thursday, April 18th, 2019. Super excited to have my friend Tim Weigel on the show. Yes, guys, it's Weigel, not Beagle. Uh, let us know you can hear us and see us. Yes, I'm still wearing the glasses. I had a whole bunch of messages in between from the last show. Can't help it. My eyes are killing me today. Uh, but the most important thing is, is we want to talk to Tim, so we want you guys to give us a heart. What's up, Dave? Uh, give us a thumbs up or a heart. Let us know that you can see me. Well, you don't really want to see me. You want to see Tim. <laughs> Uh, but hear us. Uh, so welcome to the show, my friend. I'm very excited to have you on. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. Yes. I'm excited to be here. All right. So I love the topic. We're going to get to the topic in a minute. But I want you to... Thanks, Ash. <laughs> I want you to tell me a little bit about you. They always like the origin story. People like to know, like, where did you come from? How did this... You see me. Thanks, Bob. Um, <laughs> it's a long <laughs> story about the shades, guys. Uh, but you come from a family, your family has been enmeshed in Orlando for a long time. So give us your background. So me, I'm actually born and raised in Orlando, Florida. I guess you can call that a uh, rarity nowadays. It is a rarity. Move. My family actually did move down from Pennsylvania. They are from a small city, Johnstown, which is only famous for steel and floods. Right. Literally. <laughs> That's all I know it for is the flood. Yeah. The famous flood. Yeah. So they moved down here um, probably back in the 60s. Uh, it was my grandfather, my grandmother. Um, they had eight kids. <laughs> I didn't know there were eight Vigels. I knew it was a big family, but... Eight of them. One of them actually stayed up in Pennsylvania, living just outside of Philadelphia still. Um, the other seven all moved down here. My mom is the youngest. I am an only child, so therefore she got it right the first time. Uh, I'm oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> So, but also my family's really large because we have 21, if my grandmother was alive, 21 grandchildren, and we're up around probably 46, 47 great-grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so, a big family. Yeah. Do you guys still keep in touch? Do you see each other? Do you, is everybody still here? Most of them still here? Um, most of them are still here. Um, we see each other all the time. We're going to be over at my uncle's house for a big Easter egg hunt on Sunday. We love Uncle Jim. <laughs> Hi, yes. Jim. My Uncle Jim, some of you might know him from different properties that he owns in Winter Park. Um, he's also owned several businesses throughout the time. But actually, even before him, my Uncle Tom, the oldest of the brothers, used to own Tom's Pizza, which there's only one left now. It's in Deland. He owned or started Beefy King. That's the one I remember. He started Beefy King. I'm sure, everyone One of my favorite that. places. <laughs> I love Beefy King. And here in the history of it, I guess back in its heyday, there used to be like over 30 Beefy Kings and 30 Tom's Pizzas. Wow. Like there was a lot of them. And like it was publicly traded on the stock market from what I've heard from family stories. Wow. So kind of impressive. So is that what, what, what was your, what did you want to be when you grew up? So you grew up in Orlando. Where'd you go to high school? I went to Lake Hal High School. Lake Hal. I went to Colonial. <laughs> I graduated people. Um, <laughs> what did you want to be? What did you want to do? Did you always want to get into real estate? Um, it's always been kind of like itching that I should get into real estate. You know, at the end of the day, it's coming from a family with so many different entrepreneurs. I kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur. Sure. So real estate is one way to do it. But first I had to get through school. Oh, yes. So I tell went, me about school. Went to UCF, graduated me there with the marketing. Too. Yes. Go Knights. Go Knights. Um, I do think they would beat Alabama in football. There it is. Dave probably will not like that. <laughs> um, Sorry, Dave. <laughs> but, you know, I went there, I graduated. While I was there, I was actually paying for it by working at AT&T. And then, you know. I didn't know that. What'd at, you do there, like sales? Everything. Or tech, oh, everything. At AT&T, I started in the collections department. Ouch. They have a call center beside UCF. But they paid for schooling, so I couldn't argue. Right. And here I am working part-time getting paid probably $12 an hour. Which is awesome. Free cell phone. Oh yeah. They brought us to Universal Studios Islands of Adventure for a Christmas party. Unlimited alcohol at the Christmas party. Now you're talking. Probably not the smartest thing. It was the only year they did it after they realized 50% of the people in the call center are college students. Oh yeah, college students can drink. Yeah, didn't really work out well for them. So that was like, an awesome job and then I would get quarterly bonuses and yearly bonuses what if so when you were you 
you were in collections, but you moved you moved through different departments. Yeah, I stayed in collections up to about two thousand. What is that like? It just seems like it's you're always getting yelled at. No. Yes, always getting yelled at, but it's a little different. People would yell, "Why are you calling me?" I'm like, "You haven't paid your bill. You need to keep your phone on." <laughs> Uh, but a lot of times it was also an inbound call center, so they'd call into us yelling because their phones are shut off. Uh, and so they had to go through you so you could get them back turned on. Yes, it's like, you want a payment plan or do you want to make a payment? Wow. And for the most part, it's like 90% of the time, it's their fault. They didn't pay the bill, not mine. Now, did you go straight from AT&T into real estate? Was that like your training ground? Well, it was part of my training ground because I actually moved up to manager in the call center. And then I moved from the call center to the store over in Waterford Lakes. So I was an assistant sales manager for the store. And then seeing everything going on in corporate America eventually get exhausted. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is, yeah, you've got a storefront, it's crazy. You have, a, you have demanding hours. Are you still an AT&T customer? Still an AT&T oh, customer. Oh, there you go, very nice. So. I, I finally, after <laughs> 25 years, left them. But everybody's got a good story. There's a lot of opportunity out there. There wasn't back in the day. I think I started with Bell South, and then it became AT and T when I had my cell phone. Yeah. Uh, so you made you wanted to make the leap. So what was the catalyst? You just got tired of being AT and T, and you said, "All right, I want to go do real estate." I was kind of like, "Where's my life going?" You know, I'm here. You had one of those make, moments. Make the sale, because in the stores it was literally make the sale. We had our goals. We had to find a way to do it. So I just wasn't happy. So I needed to do something that would make me happy. And while I was trying to think of where I wanted to go next, next thing you know, I'm thinking like real estate. It just made sense. It runs in the family blood. Hopefully I can do good at it. So when you first go to the cl when you first go to school and then you graduate, you get out, did it make sense then? Or were you struggling? What were some of the things that you were going through at the time? Um, when I first graduated, I mean, it kind of made sense then, but I think I was comfortable at at and because I mean, I'm getting decent pay by that time. Right, right. Uh, I wasn't stressing at all. I don't even think I was working 30 hours a week, but yet I was a salary employee. Nice. So, well, just, you did take a leap into the frying pan then because real estate is all 100% on you. You're an entrepreneur, you're done. I mean, if you don't get out there and work, you're not gonna make any money. Exactly. So, I, I definitely took a leap. <laughs> and how, how did it turn out? Did you start? Where you're at now? Yeah. You did, okay, so yeah. you started at Watson. Yeah, I started at Watson. It was I had a friend that was working for Watson and she posted something about, hey, do you wanna do real estate on LinkedIn? I saw it and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I reached out to her and she's like, oh, I think you'd be a great fit. So the only thing I had to do was go get my license. And so you went and got it. So tell me about the first couple of months in the transaction, because a lot of people, when it's your first couple of months in any business, you're learning, even though you go to class, I always tell people this, just because you go to class doesn't mean you really know anything, right? So you've oh, got to yeah. learn trial by fire, you've got to figure out, all right, what's a real contract? How do I do a contract? Uh, but in any business, you're learning during that time. Was it a struggle? Did you have mentors? I mean, my broker was definitely a mentor and other people in my office, I think were big mentors for the transition. But believe it or not, I'm thankful for at and because a lot of the stuff I learned from at and I could actually do in real estate because it's all dealing with people. Right. Sometimes people called into the call center and you have no clue what the answer is. <laughs> you literally don't. And your goal is not to let on that you don't know the clue, but find out the answer and sometimes you gotta take a risk. Did you find that you had a specific market niche? We were talking about this earlier um, at the table. Um, did you find that you had a specific niche that you wanted to get into or did you kind of just develop into that? I think or I do you have of, a niche? I kind of developed into it. I'm willing to go anywhere. Um, me and my partner actually, we've done a deal in Tallahassee. We've done a deal in Mims, Florida, which I don't recommend going to Mims. Brevard County, right? Part yes. Brevard, part Belize. Merritt Island. Yeah. <laughs> South Orlando, Kissimmee. Like I go all over um, while I still live out near UCF. But, you know, I think it's important. I think it also, for me, being that I've grown up here, I watch the city grow. Right. So I'm kind of comfortable going everywhere anyway. I think niches, I mean, I get that some people want to be a specialist in something like that's how they market. Uh, but it's a very interesting place to be if, you're, if you want to stick in one neighborhood or one zip code, which is what we were talking about earlier. 
uh, and you that's your whole marketing plan what if something what if the values aren't good there <laughs> like I get that but I love the fact I as an insurance when I had the insurance agencies we would we wrote we wrote all over Florida why why would I have somebody else down the street deal with it and make money when I could be making the money and doing the customer service and working on that so yeah it's fascinating to me the people that jump into a niche and then that's what they do I only do I love the ones um, no offense to my friends who hear this the ones that say I only deal with houses that are 300,000 or higher you're missing out on a lot of potential business look if you've got enough business and enough money to handle that great but I think as an entrepreneur it kind of it begins to limit you yeah and it's also you build knowledge with every sale like I've done a $30,000 mobile home which is very different than a single family home but now going into the next mobile home, I know a lot of stuff going into it so I can let people know. You, you learn, right? You yeah. learn as you go. Are you in an educational role? What do you, you have a team? Tell us about your, your business model. Yeah, uh, I have a partner in my business. Her name is Heather. And basically, you know, we kind of work together with heavy marketing, um, trying to find customers, obviously, and then being able to help them with their ultimate goal of either selling their house, buying their first home or second home, whatever it may be or also investments. And how do you decide on the marketing? And this is across the board, anyone. Michelle Mendez says hi. Hey, Michelle. Uh, how do you decide on the marketing? Because there's so many, doesn't matter what business you're in, we're talking about real estate now, but how do you decide on how to spend your money on the marketing? What have you found to be most effective? Um, for me, really, I've spent a lot of my marketing on the listings that I do. Because I feel that listings sometimes are underdeveloped with the way they're marketed. Like, you know, granted it costs money to market them and sometimes depending on the price point, you don't want to spend that money. But at the same point, you're marketing yourself at the same time. Correct. So you should do it across the board. So what I do for lower ends versus higher ends, they're going to be very similar. Um, now with the higher ends, there might be some other stuff I might do that costs a little more money. Sure. But the basics of marketing, whether it's getting the postcards, the flyers, the photography, um, possible videography and stuff like that, that's all gonna be the same. And what I, what I find, I love what you just said because I think it's so important for people to realize when you're marketing anything, oh thanks Carlos, when you're marketing anything in your business, no matter what your business is, you're not just marketing the services and products, you're marketing you. So the people who don't spend enough money or do things in a cheap way, and trust me guys, we all see the pictures on MLS, uh, we're talking real estate, we see the stuff that you guys do. To me that's just, all that's doing is hurting your brand, it's hurting your potential future business. Um, so talk about, the title of the show is how to be a servant leader in a demanding world. You picked that, I love that title. Why did you pick that title? Um, a lot of it's because like nowadays you always talk to someone, they always want something. I'm sure everyone gets the robocalls. Hey, come talk to me and I'll tell you how to spend money and save money. And that's just annoying. It's like you got people trying to market you and get your dollars. But in time, you don't get a lot of people that go out there and really are trying to help people. You know, like what's your why? Um, a lot of people's why is I want my business to grow. Well, not necessarily. You want to help somebody. Right. And I think that's a very lost art. Like, you know, I want something, but sometimes you got to give, 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 and then someone's going to offer something back. Did you grow up in a household where giving was important? Um, I mean, it was just me, my mom, and my grandma. So, where'd you I learn it? Because there's a lot of people. I'm amazed because it's just natural for me to just give and think about it later. I'm amazed at the people who that doesn't that thought never even crosses their mind when I when they see all of the uh, charity events or networking events and things that we do or I personally do. Um, they're like I. I couldn't even do that. Like, I think they go home and they sit and watch TV, no judgment, um, and they are amazed that anybody's out there doing the positive things all the time. Why is that, why is that important to you? Is this well, something you're instilling in your family? By the way, he's got a four-year-old, Logan. Very active. A very four -year -old. active four-year-old. Uh, but why is it important? Um, and come to think about it, now that I'm even thinking about it, I guess it kind of was instilled because my mom took care of my grandmother. So you saw an example of it. You lived so it. I saw it, even though it's still her mother. Right. But she took care of her until the day that she passed away. So it kind of was like read that early on. But I also think some of it's just from different mentors that I watched through, like say Gary Vanderchuk, Tom Ferry, 
and all that stuff. They are actually giving a lot of free content out there that's not normal, but they're not necessarily demanding stuff to come back to them, but it's still happening. And then I'm involved with a business attorney, Alpha Kappa Psi, and one of their big things that we're trying to teach the students is servant leadership. So they put on leadership uh, programs every year, which I attend, and it's always amazing watching the development and seeing the chapters that actually perform are the ones that are actually putting these pieces all together. Which is, I, I think it's so good to have that as part of your business plan, Michelle. By the way, Michelle's AK side. I love it. Hi, Michelle. Uh, I think it's so important to have that as part of your business plan and the way that you do business. I believe it makes a difference. If you go into every transaction or every discussion, every meeting, every event, networking event, I don't care what it is, and everything is so self-centered and about, oh my God, what am I gonna get? I got nothing out of that. I walked away with no business. Um, I think you're gonna be disappointed the rest of your life. I, I think people don't understand the power of planting a seed. Uh, being a servant leader really is being a servant, being a leader by example and by uh, doing things for people, not ever knowing if you're gonna get anything back. Uh, and people have a hard time with that. How do you rectify that with, okay, I do that as a servant leader, but I still have to make money? Um, people ask me that all the time, so I'm asking you. It's really patience because at the end of the day you're gonna get something back you just gotta keep doing it the problem is we're in a society where people want it the second it's all instant gratification right instant gratification and it's not gonna happen the second it's long term like you know if you look at anyone that's really built a business up it didn't happen overnight it hope been decades down the road there's, there's relationships too. People underestimate the value of a relationship. Oh, yeah. So as you're going in and you're planting the seeds and you're building relationships, there's some relationships that are just now paying off. No expectation for them to pay off. But now they're beginning to be fruitful for me personally and my businesses. Uh, and they're 10 years plus in the making. 10 years of just doing the right thing most of the time. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing, trying to do the right thing, giving back. Uh, being there, being a mentor. And sometimes it doesn't even come from the place that you're doing it with. It comes from other things. I'm a big believer in that. So you plant the seed, that seed may not provide anything for you, but because you planted the seed, the whole world, the universe, God, whatever you believe in, uh, is gonna get you back. You're gonna, you're gonna get that a hundredfold. Uh, but I think people go into it with this, they don't want the relationship, they want the instant gratification. Hey Tim, we just met. Um, so where's where's your next loan? Mm -hmm. um, that makes me insane, by the way, when people do that kind of stuff. Same thing with me. When I sit down with someone, Ted, when are you gonna send me your next XYZ deal? Dude, we just met. I mean, mm -hmm. Tim and I have been friends for a while, but we just we just sat down, we're just talking. Can't you can't you spend time to build a relationship? I think that's also servant leadership. Yeah, it really is, because you know, and I mean social media probably doesn't help. I'm sure it does not. But, you know, it kind of puts the relationships to the things. Like, why do I need to talk to you? I could find out your entire life story from Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Yes, we call it fake book. Um, <laughs> I love Facebook, though. I mean, it's been so good to me and to the people who come on the show. But if you, if you truly sit back and you're one of those people that believes that everything people put on Facebook is the reality of their life, uh, you really need to stay, <laughs> take a step back. I'm really particular about the pictures I post because I want it to be reflective of the reality. Um, I'm, never gonna, I'm never gonna be negative, but I'm also never gonna be uh, telling you something that isn't true, because guess what? People check that stuff, they fact check it. I have people that come up to me at uh, networking meetings and go, gosh, I saw your show, and you're just like, you are on the show, Ted. I'm like, well, what'd you expect? It's Facebook Live, <laughs> I can't fake this. But people, do, people underestimate how powerful the relationship part is. Oh, yeah. So when you're, look, when you're working in the field and you're developing relationships, where do you get the majority of your business? Um, basically from my sphere of influence. So I get a lot of from, from friends, family, uh, referring me business, and then from the ones that get referred to me, they end up referring business or coming back. Like I've had a few that- There's Uncle Jim. <laughs> Hi Jim. Hi Uncle Jim. So I've had like literally a friend get referred to me from someone back in 2014. Um, I helped them sell a house and buy a house, and then we just recently sold that house so they can move to Alabama. Why do you think that you get those referrals? People don't, they don't know this answer a lot. Why do you think people continue to refer you business? What's up, Sean? Um, I'm thinking they continue to refer me business just because 
they know my heart's in the right place. Yeah. I'm not going to be here to take advantage of someone. You know, I'm going to do the right thing by them and not the right thing by me. You're also, I mean, this is my observation, why I've known you, you're very mellow, right? And I think people, people, I'm sure you could get upset during a transaction, but people respond well if the person who's in charge, which is basically Tim directing the transaction, nothing ruffles his feathers. And so I think a lot of people look to that and go, oh my God, he, he can handle it. He's a calm, normally a calm human being who can take the transac transaction from start to finish. He's not gonna get ticked off at me. He may get upset because it's not going the way it is, or the way it's supposed to be, but you actually take the time, you listen to people, you, you're very um, calming. And I believe people respond to that. Uh, I, have, I have friends in the industry that it is, wow, it is just crazy on. It's, it's a scream fest every moment, everything's going wrong. And all I can say to them is, you know you're creating this, right? <laughs> Like you're, you're the driving force behind all of this and how you react is how the rest of the transaction is gonna go, how you handle it. And I think that you're, I mean, my opinion is that your referrals love you because you're mellow and calming and they know they can count on you no matter what. Well, I had some, a customer of mine back in 2015, I think it was. They said they wanted me to, to relay information. They thought it was bad news and they're like, say it however you want. It's so like, I think you'll say it in an off threatening way that they'll go ahead and do it. That's true, and people underestimate the power of positive over negative, uh, kindness over anger. And so if you're, if you're dealing with people, that's the, that's the art of negotiation. Uh, if you're dealing with people and the perception is, and you, or you put them on the defensive immediately, sugar baby, sugar mm -hmm. works so much better. Uh, and I think a lot of people, and that's how you are. I mean, I know that's how you are, I've seen you in action. Um, all right, so we're gonna share all of Tim's contact information, how you can reach out to him, um, how you can learn more about being a servant leader in a demanding world. Again, one of my favorite topics, we have a whole bunch of servant leaders that popped on uh, that do a lot of the same good. We're all trying to do good. We're trying to do good, provide for our families and leave a good imprint on the world and Tim's definitely one of those people. Any parting words of wisdom for them? Anything you wanna share before we head out? Um. I'd say the best thing I could say is don't let anything get you upset. You know, if it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. If not, it's not. You know, stay positive, even though today might be stressful, tomorrow's probably not going to be. Correct. Very zen. <laughs> all right, thanks for being on the show. Not Super problem. easy, thanks right? For me. Yeah. Uh, so again, we'll share all con Tim's contact information. We love you guys. I'll be back around seven o'clock for show number four. Uh, super excited about that, but I'm so glad I have my friend Tim on. Uh, sorry it took so long. We gotta get Uncle Jim on at some point. We should, have, <laughs> we should do a Weigel show. Can you imagine? That could be challenging. That could be, <laughs> that could be a big challenge. All right, we love you guys. We'll see you soon.